talk about some grace tonight. And um, the, we've been going through in our evening series uh, the doctrinal statement, a series called Doctrines That Matter. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about salvation, how we are saved by grace. It's almost a trite phrase anymore, especially after you sing Amazing Grace and all the other grace songs that are in the book, uh, to talk about what it means to be saved by grace. But we're going to talk about this a little bit this evening and uh, what, what grace really is all about and how it, how it relates to our salvation. But uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll spend some time here with what we have yet tonight. Lord, we just thank you once again for the fellowship, for the encouragement, for the upholding of each, each and every one of us here, Lord, um, by your grace. And we thank you that uh, your grace is sufficient for us. And we pray that we might uh, show your grace to each other uh, through every circumstances that we, that we need. And we need it from each other and we need it from you. Help us to find uh, insight and help from your word tonight as we study this together. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You think about grace. Uh, in, in our understanding of what Christianity is all about. Uh, grace really is at the core, it's at the center of what our belief system is all about as Christians. Uh, grace is what differentiates Christianity, true Bible-believing Christianity, <laughs> from every other belief system in the world. From every other religion. You say, well, it's Jesus Christ. Well, that's true. But really, it's the whole concept of grace that differentiates us. You look at the Muslim view of God. The Muslim view of God is a God who is waiting to condemn. He is only one, one pace away <laughs> from taking off your head. Sometimes that's literally in the Muslim view. Um, it's, it's a very graceless belief system. Their God, their Allah that they worship, is not a God of grace. You look at Hinduism. You look at Buddhism. You look at all of these other um, religions that are out there. They are all based on a concept of God or a concept of a higher power that has no virtue in him that's related to grace. But yet we see a God that's described for us in the Bible, in Scripture, that even from day one, even in the course of giving of the law, which seems very graceless, even in the course of that, we see evidence that God is full of grace. That's what he wants for us in our lives. He wants us to understand the concept of grace in our lives. Now, our church doctrinal statement states it this way. When it comes to salvation, it says, We believe that salvation of the sinner is wholly of grace through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that all the redeemed, once saved, are kept by God's power and secure in Christ forever. Now, we're not going to dissect the whole statement tonight. But I want us to look at three components of this tonight, and we'll look at some more maybe next week. Uh, but the first component of this, when we think about what salvation is about, it says, we believe that salvation of the sinner is holy of grace. Salvation of the sinner. You say, well, that seems like an odd place to stop. Well, the, 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 the whole concept of what salvation is, think of somebody who, who just has never gone to church. Somebody who's just never read the Bible. It's just not been a part of their life. And you come to them and you say, I want to be a witness to them. I want to, I want to share their need of salvation. Okay, what, what, do, they, what do they need saved from? What, what do they need, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the, the issue is so many people don't know that they are in danger, Right? We don't, we don't even know. I, I was out talking to some guy years and years ago, out trying to share the gospel with a guy. And, and I may have told this story before even, but 
went up to him and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Dave Donnelly from such, such a church. And he looked at me and he knew where I was going <laughs> with this. Apparently he had heard this spiel before. And he says, well, he says, you know who I am? He says, I'm Harry and I'm from H-E double hockey sticks. But he didn't spell it out for me. <laughs> he had no belief that there was any need of saving in his life. Um, you know, think about this. How many times have you seen, of course, we're not, we're not in Hurricane Alley here, but, you know, you see these hurricanes. They come up, and they're going to hit in Florida or South Carolina or Georgia or wherever they're going to hit, right? And what is the first thing to do? The, government, the governor says, state of emergency, we're evacuating all, these, all this whole coastal town, right? And then you see it on the news, and they're out with the police, and they're telling everybody to leave your homes and this and that. But somehow, there's always that guy, right, <laughs> who says, I don't need to evacuate. I'm going to just ride out the storm. I can make it. We'll be all good. No problem. Safe and sound. And then you find somewhere in the midst of 12 feet of water and 100 mile an hour winds, Somebody in a police rescue boat's out trying to get that guy from the, 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 the roof of his house or wherever he happens to be hanging out from so that he can get out of the danger that he didn't even realize he was putting himself in. He didn't believe in his need for salvation, right? He didn't believe there was a clear and present danger that was about to consume him. And that really comes down to where where we, we, we see Scripture. Because we talk about salvation sometimes with the idea, well, everybody, we all need to be saved. Well, what does it mean? Why do people need saved? Because of the second part of this. Salvation is for sinners. If we weren't sinners, we would ha not have a need for salvation. This is where Jesus is in Mark chapter 2. And you can turn there. We'll be at different passages. But Mark chapter 2, Jesus has a run-in with a group of people who were in this very state. A group of people who knew all about the Bible. They knew all about Scripture. A group of people who would have said they were doing their best to live for the Lord. And therefore, they didn't feel like there was any need of saving them. This group of people, of course, we know commonly as the Pharisees. <laughs> they didn't believe. That, what was the real heart of the problem with the Pharisees? They just didn't believe they needed saved. <laughs> they believed they had it together. They believed they had their lives figured out. And as much as we like to say they're hypocritical and wrong and all these things that Jesus said, which is true, the fact of the matter is, I believe a lot of these guys in the heart of hearts believed, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm not a sinner. And that's why it was so hard for them to swallow this message that Jesus was bringing to them. And in Mark chapter 2, here's Jesus. The situation is, it says it came to pass in verse 15, it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. So publicans, of course, tax collectors, people that were hated by the people, and in general, people that the average guy would call a sinner. <laughs> this is who Jesus was with, publicans and sinners. It says there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, this I think is the it's the first big hurdle that we have to get over with anyone that we're trying to share the gospel with. It's the hurdle that says, how do I make somebody recognize that they're a sinner? 
A lot of times we want to go in with the message, hey, don't you want to have a home in heaven? Don't you want all of the riches of Christ in your life? Don't you want... But in Jesus' is, I can't call people that don't recognize themselves as sinners into my kingdom. Because we first have to recognize our need of salvation before we can come to Jesus for salvation. You see, the problem that we, we tend to think of when we're witnessing to someone is, you just need to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you. But you see what the problem with the Pharisees was? The problem with the Pharisees wasn't that they denied or they did deny, but it's not that they didn't recognize who Jesus was. The first problem with the Pharisees was that they didn't recognize who they were. They didn't recognize their own deficits. They didn't recognize where they, where they were. And that's the problem we see with so many people today. People just are in denial about who they are who we are as sinners. And because we deny who we are as sinners, we don't see any need for salvation by grace. There's a whole movement, and I didn't know about it until recently. Has anybody heard of the movement called Easy Believism? Have you heard of this? Hey, this is, a, this is a, a group out there, I guess, that when you talk about, you know, a lot of these groups are so... Um, into having a, a great witness and having sharing your faith and getting people saved and wanting to wanting to turn the world upside down for Christ and it's there's some great enthusiasm there's some great motivation there is a lot of hard work and plans and and things that go into these types of campaigns to to, to canvas the neighborhood and to to share the share the gospel and to get people saved but in in certain segments it's gotten to the point where you just get to the point where you bring somebody in and you say, hey, don't you want to don't you want to go to heaven when you die? And of course, who's going to say no? <laughs> yeah, sure I do. Well, then you just need to say this prayer. Repeat after me. Do 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 do. Amen. Hey, you're saved. You're part of the part of the family. And I mean, maybe in some of those cases that's a conversion. But in many cases, it's just a simple, I, I wanted to go to heaven, I said a magical prayer, and the belief, my understanding of who I am as a sinner, my need for grace, and my understanding of Christ's sacrifice for me, was, there was never belief into it. There was, it was just a simple magic formula that someone knocked on my door and told me to do, and now I have this assurance that's not based on doctrine. That's called easy believism. We have to make sure when we are sharing the gospel that if you're going to get salvation, you need to first identify as someone who needs saved. You need to be recognize yourself as a sinner. There's a lot here we're not going to get to, but how do we get to the point where a sinner can find himself uh, brought to that point of salvation? We talked last time about the, the fact that man, uh, we, well, there's nothing good in us, right? That there's no good part in us. It's, it's, we're all bad. It doesn't mean we always do bad things, but it, from, we're corrupt. We have this sin nature from day one. Okay, so if that's true, and I wallowing in my sin, and I don't recognize it as sin, how do I get to the point where I say, hey, I, I need to find God? How do I get to that point? And this is another theological question, because the question is, how does a, someone who's wretched, sinner, like we hear in Amazing Grace, right? The song, such a wretch as I. How does someone like that wake up one day and decide, you know what? I think I need Christ in my life. <laughs> the answer is, they don't. Not on their own, at least. They need to be called by God. They need to be brought, brought into that place where they, they recognize their need for salvation. Now, we know from a number of verses, 1 Timothy 2.4 is an example, God's, 
God wants everybody to come to that knowledge. It says he will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We see the illustration that Jesus gives in Luke 14. He says, he gives us this illustration of the Lord and his servant bringing him to the banqueting table. And it says, the Lord said to the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Illustration of the fact that God wants us to go out everywhere, beat the bushes and find those that need to know Christ. But then we see in John 6 that God has to have a work going on in that person's life to bring them to that point where they, they recognize it. And John 6, he says, No man can come to me, this is Jesus speaking, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. So we know that there, there's got to be some work of God in that person's life to even bring them to, to that place where they recognize who they are. We've all been there, right? You ever talked to someone and you tried to share your faith with them and you tried to share them about Christ and you can just see it's not registering. <laughs> and it's just like, well, I might be talking to a brick wall here. And you say, oh, well, I'm going to plant the seed. I'm going to cast them in here and maybe it'll, maybe it'll grow up and maybe it won't. I've just got to leave that in the Lord's hands, right? But hopefully... You've had the experience as a believer to talk to someone who we call ripe fruit. <laughs> someone who, for whatever reason, whatever circumstances in life, God's been wrestling with them. They've been, they've been cultivated. In some way, their heart's just looking for answers. And, they, and they've, they've, they've been brought to that point where they're just like, I just need to understand what I don't, what I'm missing in life. And you come along out of the blue. You hear stories about this all the time. And you say, hey, do you know Christ is your Savior? And they say, that's exactly what I need. <laughs> and you can bring them to the point where they're, they're ready to accept and believe Christ because God's already been somehow at work in that heart to call them to himself. We don't understand all of the ins and outs of who God calls and why he calls them. But we do know that left to our own devices, we don't turn to God on our own. So there is that, there is that component. But the second component, which I think is just as important, in fact, I think it's, it's more important, and I think it's oftentimes neglected in our, in our presentation of the gospel, is if you recognize yourself to be a sinner, and you want to find salvation, you've, you've got this hurdle to get over. And the hurdle is, I need to find repentance. We need to have repentance in our life. And I, and I, have a, I, I, I even believe in Christians' lives today. Repentance is not a thing that we talk enough about. It's not a something that we focus enough on. Um, what is Repentance. Repentance is the, real, is the realization of the sinfulness of our sin. And then that's accompanied by a genuine, godly sorrow over what we've done. And then it, it results in a determination in our life to turn from whatever it is that's, that's brought us into that sinful state and, and make an about face. The actual word repent comes from the, the old Roman army term where they would be marching one direction and they would be, today we would call it an about face. <laughs> and they would turn the other direction and begin to march. That's a repent. And that's, that's what we need to do. I think sometimes we think grace is just like this blanket. I'm, gonna, I'm a sinner and I'm this and that and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to walk in grace continue to walk in my sin, I'm going to continue to walk in the direction that I'm walking, and, and we, we think that grace somehow negates our need for repentance. And I think we've got it wrong when we do that because God has always been a God that demands repentance. Go back to the book of Joel. Here's, I, I let's love this language, that's why I bring it up. Joel chapter 2, he says, Therefore saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, 
and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness. 2 Timothy 2 says this, He says, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Do you know, in the course of understanding the truth of the gospel, repentance is a stepping stone along the way. Part of us acknowledging the truth of who Christ is is acknowledging the change that needs to be enacted in our own life. That's why 2 Peter 3, 9 says, we talk about God's promises towards us. He says, the Lord's not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. He's long-suffering to us, us usward, not willing that any should perish. But what does it say? But that all should come to repentance. He wants us to repent. He wants us to understand that without repentance in our life, we will continue to wallow in our sin. And so that very first couple words in our doctrinal statement, salvation of the sinner, is key. How often do we forget the fact that we, we are still sinners saved by grace? Yes, we're saved. We're saved by grace. But we are still those sinners but we're saved by grace. And I guess that's the, po- the, the second part of this. Salvation of the sinner is holy of grace. Holy of grace. That's an important concept because there are those groups that teach that, you know, we get grace in dribs and drabs. <laughs> at, least that's, at least that's my interpretation of it. <laughs> you know, you come to church, you get a little dollars worth of grace you come and you give some money to the church you get another dollars worth of grace (laughs) and you know you um you take communion there's another dollar of grace and all these things add up over the course of your life and who knows what really how much grace you need to get into heaven but you better start filling the bank account (laughs) that the grace is going to come chink by chink by chink And honestly, if that's what we believe, are we really any better off than anybody else who just says, I'm going to try by my good works to make it to heaven? No, because we never know if we've got enough coins in the pot. Grace comes all at once, all-encompassing, all-powerful. It is holy of grace. There is no room in the cup for anything but grace all of grace, all of the time. And when we lose that concept of the all-encompassing grace that we need, we are diminishing the work of Christ in our life. Because Christ died for us completely, right? He paid for the penalty of all of our sins. That's why we see in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, very familiar verse, By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's like four times in the course of that verse that Paul tries to point out the fact that there is nothing but grace. He says, by grace are you saved. He says, not of yourselves, okay? It's the gift of God. Okay, gifts aren't something that we buy, that we contribute to, right? They're, they're just given to us. He says, it's not of works, Don't boast. Four times Paul makes the the emphatic statement that we've got to get rid of anything but depending on the 100% grace of God in our life for salvation. Salvation is holy of grace. And then finally, it's through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is of the sinner is holy of grace through personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this gift of salvation that's holy of grace, once we've recognized who we are, 
We've repented of who we are and we've accepted of what Christ's done by grace. How do we do that? How do we get to that point? Well, the action here is personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because even though God's made a provision for all men to be saved, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of the sins of mankind, and He desires every man to be saved. Not everybody's going to be saved. Because it doesn't work that way. You know, I, I, it, it bothers me sometimes when I'm talking to maybe non-Christians or people that don't really understand theology, and, and I hear someone say, well, you know, Christ died for the sins of the world. And it's almost this sense of, you know, I believe he died for the sins of the world and we're all going to make it. <laughs> he, 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 did it, he did it for all. We just have to, not everybody knows him, but he died for them. And our, isn't that a good thing to rest in? And there's no personal faith. There's this universal sense that Christ died for all of us and that maybe in some sense my hope is there but my personal faith has never been put in him. I think that's why so many times in Jesus' ministry, he was telling parables and he would, he would tell stories and he would try to get God's core truths across to people. And oftentimes he would end what he was saying. He would say, he that hear, hears to hear, let him hear. Because Jesus knew not everybody was going to get it. Not everybody was going to understand it. Because saving faith becomes an exclusive process for us. It's something that excludes us from other people. Because while Christ died for the Muslims and the Buddhists and everybody else in the world, not everybody, number one, is ever going to know that truth. And everybody who does know the truth isn't always going to claim that truth for their own. It has to become a personal, unreserved trust and reliance by the sinner in the person and work of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, alone. That faith has to be there. We're going to close with this because I think this just sums it up. Because, and, and it really puts the nail in the coffin, I think, for us, too. And it's Romans chapter 10. Because the question is, okay, so if that's what people need to do, if faith is how we get to the point where we accept Christ's work on our behalf, how do people come to faith? And the answer is given to us right here in Romans chapter 10, verses 12 to 17. Paul writes... There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The invitation is open to everyone. Whosoever. He says in verse 14, but. <laughs> it doesn't say but, but this is what he's saying. <laughs> he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? What about these people that haven't made that profession? He says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? What about all these people that just never have heard of Christ? He says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? That's anyone who proclaims the message of the gospel. And says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? So that's the idea of the Great Commission. And it says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? They wouldn't believe Isaiah. He says in verse 17, here's the key. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you think about this, it puts a lot back on our laps, doesn't it? How do people hear? They hear by us. They hear by people telling people. 
people using their words to explain the gospel to other people. That is the means by which God has chosen in this day and age to share his truth of salvation with the lost. He's already sent us. He's already commissioned us as believers. He's told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he's told us, here's what it is that you are to preach. The word of God. Don't give them your own ideas. Don't give them your own thoughts and opinions. Don't give them psychology. No, he says, if you want to understand how these people are going to come to faith, and read verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have a responsibility to share God's word with people around us. And as they hear it, some of those people, God is going to already be at work in their hearts. Some of those people are going to be convicted of their sin. Some of those people, God is going to reveal their own hearts to themselves, and then you can reveal the Savior to them. And we're going to find fruit in the harvest as a result of us being obedient in this area. It's all about grace, being saved by grace. And hopefully we are quick to give grace because we all were benefits of grace in our life at one point or another. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the hope that we have in it. And we pray that we'd be diligent in the work that you've given to us to share our faith, to allow it to be spoken into the ears of those that you've prepared. And we pray that hearts might be changed. Maybe even this week, Lord, bring someone into our path that you've prepared that we could speak your truth into. And share your faith so that they might come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ.